and we're recording and I'm really excited. I'm here with Amir Rajan, who is um, probably most famous for his app, A Darkroom, uh, which is mm -hmm. a just awesome, really, really cool um, app. And you've, uh, you've done, um, you've made four, four total apps, right? Or, or at least um, from something that I um, read in uh, last, or 2019. Yep, uh, I've got a, a dark room out there, which was um, a port of a web-based game by Michael Townsend. And uh, I kind of like re -envisioned, re envisioned the game, fixed a lot of the pacing, added my own narrative elements to it. Um, after that, I did the pre-sequel, uh, which I created on my own called The Ensign. Um, and then uh, there's another game called A Noble Circle. Have you ever read uh, a Flatland Romance of uh, Many Dimensions? Um, no, no, but uh, but one of my questions is, could um, um, could you talk about um, could you talk about that? Because because it seems like um, it seems like it might be kind of boring, but um, but but it's obviously not because you because um, you read this book and were so inspired by it that you made a whole app. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I built a game called A Noble Circle, which was inspired by that book, and we we can talk about it. Um, and then I built another game called Mildly Interesting RTS. Um, it's an RTS that's mildly interesting. Uh, I love the sins of a solar empire and uh, I went to like some bite-sized like RTS gaming uh, on my, on my uh, phone. So that's, so I built it because of that. And then I really like uh, the, the game of go. So I built a game called alpha go and then our dark room made its way to Android and Nintendo switch. Um, but uh, yeah, those are all my titles. Cool. Um, cool. That's awesome. Oh, and, and I, I really like the game of Go too. So, um, so, so, you, um, so AlphaGo is the same name as um, DeepMind's program, right? Oh, so mine's called Beautiful Go. Sorry. Did I say AlphaGo? I meant Beautiful Go. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, so your, um, yours is called Beautiful Go? Yep. And um, Go programs are really, really hard. Um, um, do you mind if we, um, I, I wanted to talk about a dark room, but now I'm just way more interested in your Go program. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, have you ever, have you ever watched the anime Hikari no Go? Um, no, no, I haven't. Um, I haven't actually. So it's a, it's actually a cult classic. Uh, you can, I think you can watch it on Netflix and Hulu still. Um, but it came out in the eighties and it was an anime based off of the game of Go. Uh, base, uh, basically this, uh, this expert go, uh, player from like the old, from like a very ancient, uh, uh, period in Japan ends up haunting this kid and plays go through him. But then the kid himself learns to love go. And, um, it's just a, it's just a, it's just an interesting anime. Usually you think of animes with a lot of fighting and blood and killing and ninja swords and stuff, but this one's about the game of go. And I really liked, I love the anime so much that I wanted to like practice Go, but I didn't have the facilities to like have like a full Go board. And every app out there was just really bad at just giving you a digital Go board that you can just, you know, have a position, uh, take a, try some life and death problems and just kind of set up for play, for pass and play. So instead of doing like all the AI stuff and everything that all the other apps are trying to do and limit the player to only do like legal moves, I just wanted a nice digital Go board. And so I made a beautiful Go before the, uh, because of that. Oh, that's, uh, that's really cool. Yeah, and, and Go, is, um, Go is just really, really fascinating um, with um, like, especially the, um, especially the apps because, uh, um, because like, um, like you mentioned, like, like if you try and get into the AI, then it's really, really tough. And then, it, and then it seems like um, it, it's been a while since I've tried a um, online Go, but it seems like a lot of them just are um, just are really like clunky and weird and um, not uh, like it's really enjoyable to play physical Go, but then like playing on the app just is kind of painful. Yeah, and I just wanted that. I wanted to capture that experience of playing physical Go in an app and just remove all the noise and just have a go board that I could take around with me. So that's why I built beautiful go for that. Cool. That's, uh, that's awesome. So, so what's beautiful go it, um, available on it's, it's an iOS app. It's an iOS app and I, and, and iPad. Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's one of my, uh, that's one of my, um, I, I'm not sure the right word, but, uh, but I only use Android. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so I only, uh, I can only use one of your, 
um, one of your apps um, so far. Yeah, and we and we can go into like uh, the reasoning behind that and like the motivation as an indie game dev and all that stuff. So um, everything's uh, everything's fair game if you want to like behind the scenes on all that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, and, and I think uh, uh, that. That's a uh, that's a question that I have too, and I think a lot of uh, I think a lot of indie developers probably have is well, what uh, what what should I do? Should I make it Android? Should I uh, put there more users? Should I make it iOS? Because I because I might get rich, um, or 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 what? And I'm sure it's uh, I'm sure it's not nearly as um, simple um, simple as that decision. But um, but but could you um, could you talk about uh, could you talk about that? Because even with like Godard, yeah, definitely. Um, then then you started with. You started with iOS, then it became super popular in iOS. Then, uh, um, then you did. Uh, um, then you started moving it to other platforms. Uh, but, 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 can you talk about the like your reason why and all that? Yeah, um, it really just comes down to uh, income potential. So, if you have a, I, I do premium games, um, and so this might be different for, for like uh, uh, apps that have uh, ads or you know some other monetization strategy. But for premium games, um, for me, on the on the high, a mediocre a game with like reasonable success uh, has a ratio of three to one to Android. So if it was reasonably successful on Android and iOS, your revenue will be three times higher on iOS, just flat out. Um, on the on the high end though, when you hit the number one spot. Your uh, your uh, revenue potential is twenty to one, so a number one a number one iOS app will make twenty times more than a number one Android app. And again, this is only on the premium side of things, so it might be different on um, the uh, like the ad based or other revenue models uh, monetization schemes. But for me, ads are not feasible because I'm so, I'm I'm an indie dev. I'm not going to get a lot of downloads. I'm not king or something that can have. Uh, what's it called? Uh, acquisition uh, user acquisitions at seven dollars per you know KPM or per click or whatnot. So I'm not getting like a millions, millions and millions of impressions. So for me, um, it's about having that small niche audience that I cater to and then um, uh, provide premium experience experiences for them. Um, and because of that, premium makes sense. Doing ad based approach, I've never seen that make a ton of money for like small indie devs. Uh, but yeah, it it really just comes down to money, man. Um, and the formula is, is that it, and uh, the other thing is device frag fragmentation. Uh, on iOS, I have five devices to test on. If it works on those five devices, I know I'm good. As, as far as like form factors and uh, specs and things like that. Uh, for Android, it came to like 15,000 device combinations to make sure compatibility worked across that. And I mean, it's just, it's not possible. I've gotten one star reviews of people saying, this app sucks. It cuts off like the bottom portion of the screen. I can't believe I bought it. I want to refund, blah, blah, blah. And I look at their device and it's like this old tablet that they got from a restaurant with an attached keyboard that is that is uh, glued on in landscape mode. And so my game is portrait, but the, the, like the operating system that was on it forced landscape for everything. So every portrait app was cut off from the bottom. And... I was blamed for this, and I'm just like the the device fragmentation is just terrifying. Um, so those kind of things just make it daunting for for indie devs to uh, to deal with Android. That and and uh, there is a piracy issue. Um, moment I got put my game out there, it was already like the AP the APK was already extracted, and people were pirating it. I think the piracy rate was nearly eighty to ninety percent on Android. So yeah, that's kind of what does it. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of that's kind of disheartening. Uh, it's okay. I mean, it happens. Um, uh, the money is still worth it. Like it was still worth it to go to Android and and uh, for my other properties, I'll eventually, when I have time, uh, port those over to because uh, it does generate revenue. But I vet the market on iOS, and then I divide that number by three or twenty, <laughs> and <laughs> if that number makes sense to port it over to Android, then I'll port it over to Android. That's kind of the math on it. Cool, and that's a uh, that's really interesting. Um, that, that, that's an interesting and, and pretty straightforward strategy. So, um, so yeah. cool. It costs money to to have a Mac and iOS apps and stuff, but I mean, uh, yeah, I like making money too. It helps. It helps that you know the it's very profitable to do that. Um, and then, um, can you talk about the the switch um, port? 
Yeah, so the Nintendo Switch port, I redid the entire thing, actually. Um, I gave it, like, a Game Boy aesthetic. So uh, on iOS and Android, it's in portrait mode, and you can play with, like, your a single hand and do your taps and everything. But on the... Uh... Sorry. My computer just went to sleep. Hey, there we go. Hey there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, my, com my, my computer decided to go to sleep. Uh, let me let me turn on my don't go to sleep program. There we go. Okay. And um, yeah, so the Nintendo Switch, um, I, I wanted to feel like you were starting up, when you start up the game, you were playing on like an old school Game Boy. So I added like the green green screen and like the dot matrix like grid and layout and just completely read the visuals for landscape mode and to have that feel that your Nintendo Switch just went back um, 30 years into into the original Game Boys that, that existed back then or 20 years. Um, so that's that, that's what primarily uh, was added to the, uh, that was the changes that it made to the Switch port. I added uh, additional content and some uh, additional developer commentary on, the, on there also, but um, that went really well too. It was, it was a good success. Cool. That's uh, that. Uh, that's awesome. And I and I read that. Um, so so actually, the Wikip the Wikipedia page on the Dark Room says that it's uh, that it's been pulled from the Switch. But 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 I actually like like before this interview, I, I bought it on the Switch. So, um, yeah. So, so, uh, so that was a that was a little bit of a publicity stunt uh, to to get visibility into the game. I added a little Easter egg in there, um, and um, uh, it was sensationalized as I expected it to be. And uh, um, it was pulled as I expected would happen. And um, then I fixed the issue and then it came back in the store, gave me, uh, gave me a, a nice little visibility because you're not gonna, uh, indies, indies, small indies are not gonna get um, interviews with Eurogamer, right? They won't, they won't give you the time of day, but suddenly when you do something, uh, something crazy or like you hit the limelight somewhere else, then, then they're knocking on your door to try to get interviews. So uh, because of my little little stunt, um, I got interviews with uh, Eurogamer, uh, which subsequently had follow-up articles in Ars Technica um, and uh, Kotaku and like some of the other large publications out there. Um, but if you want like the full behind the scenes stuff, um, I cover it in another podcast. It's called Literate Gamer. And if you Google like Amir Rajan switch shenanigans, you'll, you'll get the full behind the scenes on everything that I went through with regards to like testing the market, seeing the standard deviation, uh, trying to leak the Easter egg in like smaller communities and then building it up to try to see when I can hit that critical mass and uh, see how it uh, affected sales. But um, but yeah, so that was, uh, the Wikipedia article hasn't been updated yet basically. But, uh, um, um, cool, but um, cool. these are the so, kind of things um, you have to do as an indie. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm 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 really excited to listen to that um, to that full story because it's uh, it's it's um, it, it it was just really really interesting and and you're not really like telling like the subject so I'll um, I won't I won't quote Wikipedia on that. Um, yep. Yeah, and as far as Wikipedia, the article just needs to be updated. Uh, it was it was pulled, um, but then it came back. Cool. So, um, so, so I want to, um, I want to tell um, about like my experience with the dark room on on Switch, uh, because okay. uh, be, uh, because when I uh, when when I con when I contacted you about the um, about the about doing um, the interview, um, I um, I'd I'd read um, I'd read some stuff you'd written about um, I think it was something something about reviews and like reviews for um, like how reviews for indie developers just mean uh, yes. um, just so much. And um, and I thought, oh, that's um, that's really really cool because because um, I actually I, I I used to be like number one hundred and eighty something on Amazon reviews. Um, just, uh -huh. just, I really really like reviewing, um, and then um, and then I've done a whole bunch of reviews for Google Maps too. So just like 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 that's kind of my or that, that was my hobby until I moved to Thailand. Or or, or actually, um, um, Google Maps was my hobby um, like initially in Thailand. But but anyway, I'm kind of yep. getting off. Subject. So, uh, um, so, um, so anyway, I uh, um, before um, before before this interview, I I, I bought um, I bought a dark room on the Switch um, store, it, and and my experience with it was just really really cool. I, I really loved the retro um, stuff because mm -hmm. like, like I grew up in the '80s, or, or um, I, I was born in the '70s, but grew up in the '80s. Um, I had a Commodore 64, and and yep. like, um, like I know you were going for the Game Boy look, but um, but that like really could have been well. Besides the line going across, 
um, pretty yep. much all of it would have been like aesthetically like on the Commodore 64. So, um, so I, I so, spent way too much time on getting that just right. I actually like added drop shadows because the the scan the screen isn't isn't actually recessed. But if you look at the game, you'll see like border uh, drop shadows around the border because the original Game Boy had like a recessed screen, so you'd have uh, like little drop shadows around the border and stuff. But I I spent way too much time on like uh, uh, color saturation, making sure that it looked as as close to possible as the original Game Boy. Um, oh yeah, um, yeah, because because um, that um, just the um, just the like retro look of that um, is just like the coolest thing I've ever seen. And um, yes, I know that uh, like, like probably. Um, probably most people like uh, like that were born in the last like thirty years or so um, um, look um, um, look at look it, at it, know, what the hell is this crap? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, but it's uh, it's just uh, it's just awesome. So um, so so then I was playing through it, and I, and I was um, I was thinking of just playing through it, um, um, playing like like thirty minutes to prep for the interview, but um, but then I was like, oh, this is um, this is you really, get sucked really, in. Yep. Yeah, 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 um, and then. Um, and, uh, and then I finished it, and, and um, like like during it, I was thinking, oh, this uh, this reminds me of this other game that I uh, this reminds me of this this other game that I played a while back, and I was trying to think about it, and then I um, and then uh, um, then I listened to one of your interviews about like um, like doing iOS stuff, so um, so um, so I thought, oh well, I wonder if it got ported to Android, yep. um, and then I um, and then I looked up on Android, and I realized oh um i bought this game already and then i scrolled <laughs> um, and then i scrolled down and i and i gave you a glowing five star review like four i appreciate um, that years ago. Um, so, um so so i kind of want to um, i um, i know this is an interview about you not um, you listening to my review but um no no I, I love talking about this stuff so i got all the time in the world man no worries <laughs> so um so here's my uh, here, um, here's me reading my review this okay. uh, uh, um, of the Android version. Um, okay. And, um, and then, um, and then when I was reading, I was like, "Oh, the game that I, um, the game that it reminded me of was actually this, um, this game, but the Android port." And I think, um, I think that because of like because of the passage of time, like like well, it's probably mostly because it was four years ago. Um, but then also, um, also the aesthetics are are different, and the pacing's really really different too. And then the uh, the dark mm -hmm. path, uh, the, the dark path being a full map. Um, yep. Also, uh, like something about it didn't ever trigger. Hey, I've played this game before. So, um, so, so right. I finished the whole. I, I finished the whole game, and, and and on the Switch, I actually took twice as long as I did on Android um, to um, to finish it. Just like I like to play games slow and like figure stuff out. Um, you got to so, try the alternate ending if you haven't already, because the alternate ending adds another element to the game. Uh, you get to, you get a bit more like uh, lore and stuff in there too. Um, so, so is that um, is that the hint on the end screen that says, yes. uh, okay, I, um, I didn't realize because um, um, because like like sometimes sometimes there's stuff like that and you do it and there, you get like a flower or something like that. So no, um, so you get a legitimate like uh, uh, story. Yeah, I didn't want it to be that. I wanted it to be like a legitimate alternate ending. So it's uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, okay. So um, so so I. Um, so, so anyway, here's my here's my review of review. your of your Android um, port. This is a perfect game, and it's probably the only perfect game I've ever played. And and I'm uh, well, I usually am, am pretty like complimentary on all on all my reviews, mm -hmm. but um, but I, but like this uh, um, the Android version, I just really really liked. As soon as I finished the game, I immediately played through it a second time. I have replayed games before, but never immediately after. It's pretty short. It took me about three hours each time. This reminds me a lot of the great games of the 1980s. Their graphics were sparse, but they had lots and lots of thought behind every piece. Once you beat the game once, you unlock a cool developer commentary that I loved. At first, elements of the game seem weird and out of place, but then I realized it all fit together into, into its unique story. I found this looking for a text-based adventure game like Zork. Um, yep but it's button pressing with no text commands, but it reminds me of what I liked a lot about Zork, except this game isn't impossible. And, and I, um, like I, I tried Zork like so many times, but I only got to like, like two out of um, 10, whatever. Yeah, and typing on the phone is such a pain in the ass. So I wanted to like streamline, <laughs> having that streamline to be like button clicks and you know options just significantly helped. So anyway, I was, I, I was totally surprised. I appreciate that, man, I really do, yeah. 
Uh, um, thanks. Um, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, and and yeah. So so I think the switch port is even better than yep. your uh, um, than your Android port. Um, so 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 I'm not really sure how I can um, say, hey, well, I know I know I just I know I said four years ago that the this other version the game was perfect, perfect but this is even. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's really interesting, especially with like, uh, uh, at least myself and indie devs, is that, uh, like, I mean, I love I love the games that I built. Um, they're like my babies and stuff. So, uh, making sure that they represent the best, they put their best foot forward. They have they're the best representation of like what I think the uh, perfect rendition of the game should be. Um, is exactly that. Like, I will update the game. I don't care if no one plays it. I'll still update the game to make sure. Um, again, my computer goes to sleep. Why does it do that? Sorry, be right back. Hey, I'm back. That's so annoying. And I and I turned on the application that's supposed to keep it from going to sleep. Sorry. Um, but yeah, we. Uh, I love uh, coming back to my games and making sure that they're they're just right. Um, so there is a plan. It, it's again, if when I have time. Uh, it, it is a plan to go back to the iOS and Android version and add, a, add the extended play elements in there and some of the aesthetics that um, were in the Switch version just to kind of give it uh, just lessons learned. I think I, uh, there are a lot of nice things that I discovered uh, while uh, rebuilding for the Switch. So those eventually will come back to iOS and Android. So your, your review will uh, still uh, hold water. Cool, cool. Um... So, so did you play any of those like super old style like text adventure games like Zork or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or? I played Zork. Um, I got about I got, got about as far as you probably did. Um, uh, and I played um, NetHack, um, uh, which is which is like the ASCII map with the ASCII map was inspired from. Um, so uh, that's another one of those like old school like Rogue. It, 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 Rogue was the OG original uh, OG Rogue game because it was called Rogue. But uh, NetHack came in uh, afterwards and it's just one of those like beautiful games. I tried Dwar Dwarf Fortress, um, I died. And uh, that's on my list of potentially come back to, but I've played quite a few of the retro games. It's kind of what I grew up on too. Um, so uh, it, was, it, it was nice to be able to revisit that age again and uh, Revision it with uh, some, uh, what's it called? Uh, some literacy uh, with regards to game design, because back then uh, the game, the game developers, the the art, the art medium, and the art, uh, the artistic medium was still pretty new, and we've learned uh, quite a few things with regards to like uh, interest curves, pacing, um, uh, uh, media stress, and narrative elements, and uh, how to how to keep uh, how to keep the player engaged and whatnot. So coming back to those old retro games, but applying what we've learned across over the last, the last 50 years or 40 years uh, was, was really cool. Um, and uh, it, I'm excited to maybe see how narrative elements such as, such as Zork or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy could be re-envisioned, still retro, but in this day and age. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, um, interesting when I, Interestingly, when I was like, um, like, like the question I had when I was playing through the Switch is when, uh, when did this game like, like, like when did this game start? When did it take place? Yeah. Or, or, or like, like when, when was it originally developed? Um, because, yep. um, it, and I know from Wikipedia it was like 2013, right? The, yep. um, and, uh, but, uh, but, but it's really, really interesting. Just, just that you have something, uh, you have something very, very modern. That's uh, that's very very retro and and like theoretically it could have been developed like way way long ago but um, but but it was developed now so um, so so just that uh, that whole thing I think is very very interesting. Yeah, and uh, you can actually play the uh, the web version of a darkroom too even today. So it's it's also cool to kind of see what vision Michael had and um, how his his vision of the game uh, transformed over a seven year period versus the vision I had and how it transformed over a seven year period. Um, so you can kind of like see where we diverge and converge and, and, um, and uh, kind of see, get, a, get a, a visibility into our, you know, our own motivations and psyches as far as what we, what we value within, within games and game mechanics. 
but yeah, I would try the web version and see if you like it. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and I've um, I um, I played it for like a little bit. It, it looks like like aesthetically, it looks very very similar to the Android version. Yes. So um so, yeah. so so was that something that like after you made Android, did the um, did they um, did they update because uh, the web version is an open source. Um, right. So the aesthetics for the web version were actually when it uh, drew me to the game. And uh, the web version aesthetics were actually applied to iOS and Android. It kind of fit pretty well for the mobile platforms. So it, it was the other way around. I took the aesthetics from the iOS and uh, the web version to apply that to iOS and Android. What I significantly changed, though, was the narrative elements. Like the builder in the web version doesn't speak or anything. There's like no narrative elements whatsoever. And um, Another thing that I was changed was the pacing. So if you if you start both games at the same time, you hit light fire, you can kind of see the difference in in pacing and uh, the interaction that the player has with with the game itself. Um, and then the dusty path itself has some different mechanics in there, different narrative elements. Uh, but uh, you'll you'll see the divergence and uh, divergence with regards to difficulty um, and then storyline and uh, some of the other nuances that are uh, that are between the two versions. Cool and um, and then also um, like like with pacing, that's um, that's something that I noticed too. Because um, I uh, th um, this morning I opened up um, an um, Android and and played through it a little bit, and I noticed that pacing um, pacing between Switch and the Android version is very very different. And and I think that's kind of something that threw me off of realizing, hey, I've played this game before, uh, because the Switch mm -hmm. um, the Switch version um, really feels more like a video game. Where, yep. uh, where the um, the Android version, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure how to describe it, but like, like it's technically a video game, but, but but like the Switch version feels like, hey, I'm playing a video game. I, I, I don't know yeah. if that makes sense at all, but no, no, it makes total sense. Uh, so the Android and mobile versions, uh, they, one, they didn't have sound. Uh, I found that a lot of people that play mobile games, at least I do, I always play them muted, um, because you know I'll be on the can playing my video game, and I want the sound effects going on, going around. So uh, the games were always, uh, uh, both games didn't have any sound in them except for the developer commentary. And the other thing with the iOS and Android version was that I wanted to be able to quickly put it away. So I can, I'll be standing in line. I want to be able to stoke the fire a couple of times, maybe, you know, reallocate my workers and then quit. Um, so the, the pacing and the, uh, the uh, length of the Android version and iOS version was tuned in such a way for pick up and play. So you just pick it up, play a little bit, and then put it put it away. But you can always come back to it, and it leaves uh, leaves where uh, it picks up where you left off. The Switch version is definitely more interactive. That's why you have the sounds, the uh, all the all the little sound effects, and the the background uh, the background uh, I guess loops and whatnot when you go to the different areas. Because um, I wanted that to be like an, a very immersive experience. Um, I kind of envisioned myself playing the game like as if I was a kid under the covers late at night, you know, my parents don't know that I'm awake, but I'm, I see the glow of the screen under the covers as I, as I play the game. That's kind of what I, uh, that's the feeling that I wanted to have with, uh, with the Switch version. Cool. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that, that's definitely the feeling that I um, got playing the Switch version. So I think it worked out, uh, it worked yep. out really well. And, um, yep. and the, uh, the developer commentary um, on the on the switch version is really cool because you uh, um, you use some of the like original developer commentary yep um, and, and then like inter, um, intersperse it with uh, with you giving like current switch developer commentary right yeah and that's exclusive to the switch version so you get the the iOS and Android version have the original developer commentary which has additional information in there um, and then so you can hear the full developer commentary there and then you get the switch version that adds adds to that uh, outward narrative. The, the narrative that exists outside of a dark room. Cool. And um, so, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that your, um, uh, um, you, uh, your games, uh, your games, at least your first three games are, are, um, are paid games. And, um, yep. and, and then some, um, something about me, like, like I, um, I, I think I'm in a kind of small demographic, but I, I almost never get free games um, just yeah. because um, just because I like hate I I hate loot, loot boxes and microtransactions and that kind of um, exactly. and that kind of stuff. So uh, um, so so before I, uh, before I get a free game with in-app purchases, I I, I like read uh, read a whole bunch of stuff. Oh oh like uh, like um, where's the paywall? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just this is just for levels um, like levels one through five are free and levels um, um, seven, six through fifteen are, are paid. So, uh, so so I'm I'm okay with that. But uh, but just like so many free games, just um, just I um, I don't um, well, well uh, they're, uh, they're not uh, they're not really for me. But but that's probably the quickest way to make money doing app app development. So. Uh, so, so I'm kind of wondering, like, why, uh, why, uh, why haven't you made like a, um, uh, why haven't you made like a clicky, um, like, yeah, one of those, the, the, the make, uh, the make lots of money that um, that 98 percent of everyone's um, paying for, but 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 people like me just don't like. Why why don't you make stuff like that? Cool. Um, so for me, uh, it really just comes down to those are not games that I want to play, right? Um, so I'm a gamer. I, I kind of feel that I myself am I'm the customer. So I I want an experience that you know is enjoyable. Like I'm a, I grew up playing games. I love them. Um, and you have a busy life as an adult, and I want mobile games that are enjoyable to play and capture and help me get my fix and capture that those uh, those moments that you know I wish I could sit in front of a TV for three hours straight and you know uh, really dig into a game, but I can't. So those are the kind of experience I want. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want experiences that, that just try to uh, cripple gameplay to present me a loot box of some type or you know some variation of that. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why I put the time at the end of the game. Uh, so time to complete was like 300 minutes or 250 minutes or some, something, because then it allows you to compare it to what you paid for the experience, right? Like. You go out to the movies when we were when we were able to go out to the movies, I guess. <laughs> um, and it's like you, just by yourself. If you went to the movies by yourself, you're you're spending twenty bucks for an hour and thirty minutes, of of or maybe two to three hours maximum, and you're getting about five hours of gameplay for two bucks. Like the it, that's a good deal. Like as far as you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know that's a that's a uh, that's a good amount of entertainment. And then um, the Nintendo Switch version has the has the Nintendo tax on top of it. But even at you know five, six dollars, yeah, getting getting five, five to ten hours of gameplay with the alternate ending is just it's just, you know, it's a it's a good amount of money. And you complete it, you finish the game. It's like it's finally done. You can put it away. It's a good thing. So um, yeah, I I, that's why I didn't do any of like the the free never ending loot box monetization stuff. It's just because those are not the games that I I myself want to play. Uh, so with mildly interesting RTS is actually free, with one in that purchase that unlocks the full game. So it's kind of like free to start. You get the demo experience, and I'm fully upfront with this. Like this is the demo experience. Try it out. Enjoy it. You can play this as much as you want. If you want the full experience with the extra maps and stuff like that, then you you pay the one ninety nine to to unlock the the full experience, and um, that's so that, that, that worked pretty well. So, so so that's a huge relief because I uh, because uh, because I saw um, I saw your um, I saw your prices uh, like paid 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 free and I thought oh oh no he's um, he's sold no out. I didn't sell out I didn't sell out it's got one uh, one in a purchase and I don't even present I don't even have a nag screen. Um, I let the player play, and then I time uh, when when they play for like uh, like 15 games, and then I have a button that shows up saying like, "Hey man, you you've played 15 games of this. Let me tell you who I am. My name's Amir. I love RTSs. These are the RTSs I've played. Um, I hate the nickel and diming stuff. So for like two bucks, you're supporting an indie dev, and you're going to get all these uh, additional maps and additional abilities." But if you don't want it, you can you can just you know play the regular game and enjoy it. I never show an ad. I never like cripple gameplay. It's just the perfect game, except uh, uh, you get more maps and more abilities if you if you unlock it. So it works out really well, and uh, I only target uh, and it's just good. It it was it was a good thing. It wouldn't work for a dark room because it would break the immersion. But for mildly interesting RTS, it, it actually made sense. Um, the other game that I had was a Noble Circle. I have a free version of that, but the free version is the prologue. So you you play the prologue, and then at the end it says, now you've played the prologue and you get a feel for what the game is about. Now take the real journey, and then that takes you to the to the full paid application. Um, so that's kind of how I've done a monetization to give give people a taste 
to see what the game's like and see if they like it or not. I mean, I understand the benefit of having free for that purpose, but they always convert to some fixed price. You know you're paying it and then you're done and you never have to worry about me coming back for more money. Cool. And, um, and so, so something I really liked about the dark room is that, um, is that it has, it, it has a lot of the like progressing, uh, um, the, the progressing elements that, that a lot of yep. the, uh, that a lot of the, that a lot of those, um, that a lot of those games, idle games and like those, yep. Uh, uh, the, the, a lot of those games that I don't like that, um, that, that say, oh, well, um, now, uh, uh, now that you've got, um, now, now to get the laser, then you can either like click this button uh, for the next like seventy two hours or pay like like right. like ninety nine for coins. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, so it's kind of uh, it's kind of got the progression with that, but 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 like timing wise, um, um, timing wise, like well, well, the thing um, the thing that I don't the biggest thing that I don't like about those is not uh, not not that I have to pay, but just that I really don't like playing a game and then I have to wait for something. Um, and, th right. and, and that's uh, that's the really cool thing about the dark room is, is it has a lot of those kind of really addictive elements, but you never have to wait. Like, like the longest you have right. to wait. There's is, always something to do. Yeah, and, and the longest you have to wait is at the begin at the very beginning where uh, where you click the button to go get some wood, um, and then yep. uh, um, and it feels like uh, it feels like forever. Um, but um, but 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 you've got this uh, you've got this thing. Okay, um, I, the storyline being built out. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, so, so that's uh, that's like the that's like the longest that, that uh, th that's the longest that it feels like um, you actually have to wait for something in um, in a dark room. So, um, so, so I know you've already talked about pacing, but um, but like the um, the pacing the, the pacing of that is just really really uh, like interesting and fascinating to me, and especially um, especially because like like I think if I um, I think if I took something like uh, um, like like a dark room, the web, and then like started modifying it, that I would like break it all um, instead yep. of um, instead of actually making it better. Um, so 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 I'm wondering like like how you took something like that complex and that tight and then made it better and then made it better again. Yeah, I think uh, for me the pacing was always about presenting new game elements, letting the player get comfortable with those game elements. Um, to the point where they're almost about to be bored and then introducing a new element. You do it too quickly and they get overwhelmed. You do it too slowly and they get bored. So it was this balancing act of like uh, playing the game, getting a feel for, well, was there enough time for the builder to wake up? Did it feel good? And then watching other people play the game. Uh, so I will let, I'd let people that have never played the game play it just once. Because you get that, you only get that first impression, the fresh eyes, that one time, and I just kind of watch them, and kind of see when they decide that they, you know, like, yeah, yeah, that was fun. Here you go, um, and then just kind of kept track of those like small, small moments and really tuned it in. I man, I played the game way too many times. I've I played the game obviously way, way, way too many times. So the the pacing had to be really tuned in, and. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of play testing, a whole, whole lot of play testing. And then after you've played it a hundred times or so, uh, there's points where you get bored and you're more sensitive to those boring points. And so you go like, and, and I've overcorrected, I'll speed it up too much. And then I'm like, wait, that's way too fast for someone that's new. So you just, yeah, you just, it's a pain in the ass, bottom line. <laughs> it's It's been seven years of iteration, basically. <laughs> wow. Um, so... So when um, with the uh, when uh, when you play test it, do you uh, when you play test it, do you have a way to like speed up or like start at a certain point or uh, because uh, because even though it's a fast game, uh, j just I'm wondering about like the whole process of that. I I, I don't know very much about app development, so um, yeah. So, 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 uh, so yeah, super super... yeah. If I'm doing like uh, if I'm doing like new mechanics or bug testing, I can I have facilities in there that let me like fast forward to a specific point in time. Uh, but before a, like a legitimate release, I do a as a player play test from end to end um, as if I was as if I was playing the game. So um, it just depends on the mode that I'm in. Uh, but yeah, there are times where the play test is empty game, full uh, brand new install, play the game, play the developer commentary, play the alternate ending. 
And um, surprisingly, there's there's actually people that are speed running the game. So there's a guy that has beat the entire game in 17 minutes. <laughs> and I wow. and it's like, and I theoretically I can see how that's possible, but the the fact that he was able to pull it off is like how how were you able to pull off a 17 minute run but uh they were able to do it and i was like you did it um so it's pretty amazing how quickly you can get through the game um my average playthrough takes about uh 70 minutes now so i can get through the entire game in about in about a, a little over an hour just because i you know i know exactly um what i need what i need to do and and um just quickly optimize and, and run through it so have you tried speed running it or, or is that just like your, that my fastest time has been 56 minutes, but okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, you did in 17. I'm like, you win. <laughs> I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to try to beat that 17 minutes. I was like, yeah. Okay. There you go. Good luck. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, that, that, that is really, that is really cool. You could oh, probably so do the switch version faster, um, as, especially with the cu the couch co-op. If you have a second player that helps you out, you could put, you could theoretically might be able to beat that seventeen minute time. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see if anyone uh, is able to do it. So so how does um, how does that work with how does that work with couch co-op? Because I, I I don't really have someone to, uh, and, and I can't really picture how um, how you can um, have two people playing that game. Yeah. Uh, so couch co-op. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, when when a, a ADR detects the second controller in there, um, this wanderer contraption floats into view. So you like control this like little weird puzzle square thingy in the bottom left hand corner. And um, this is spoiler, so you know you might want to skip the next thirty seconds if you want. But uh, what the what player two has to figure out is figure out what these buttons on this robot do. And this, the buttons on the robot uh, do things like gather wood, check traps, but there's no labels on these buttons. They're just like Morse code. And so when you're and when you're on the dusty path and, and in battle, uh, the robot can like throw grenades for you or heal you, um, and kind of kind of kind of like as a support character. So it's it's for the couch co-op is for the casual gamer that wants to participate in your gaming but doesn't necessarily want to, you know. Uh, have a have a strong influence on whether you win or lose, but you know they heal you when you're low on health, and you're just like, yeah. Um, so that's kind of how the couch co-op. It's kind of like Mario's uh, uh, in Super Mario Galaxy, where you were able to like shoot the stars and things like that uh, back on the uh, the Wii. So it's got it's got that aesthetic to it. Huh, but that's so how couch co-op works. Um, cool. So so it sounds like um, it sounds like a, this kind of cool like semi-alternate version of the um, the game that would like add replay value if you have someone yep. um, cool that's uh, that's awesome I'll have to I'll have to check it out um, yeah um, when I uh, when I have somebody to um, play uh, play it with um, yep so so one of the one of the really interesting things about a dark room is that there are no instructions mm -hmm. uh, like, like there's no like uh, there's no tu there's no tutorial there's no yep. uh, um, there's uh, there's no nothing and, and that's kind of a um, that's kind of a really gutsy move like like basically uh, basically saying hey well um, my uh, my game is so good that you don't need instructions and um, yep. and and it was just uh, like like what you're describing about the uh, what you're describing about the co-op mode um, and and that and that kind of new mechanic is kind of like my experience in in like figuring it out um, like uh, like I um, I personally don't like dying in in games so um, so when I was playing through like I did everything to not die and then and then I died and then I uh, and then I died again and then I realized oh um, when you um, like like when you go out on the path then uh, or, or then it, then the save point is basically right there um, so, right. so, so, um, so, 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 so it never actually says that. But after you, um, after you die a couple times, then you kind of realize, oh, okay, this, uh, uh, this is this, and then, and it's the same way with like uh, tons and tons of other mechanics. Like, like nobody actually tells you, but, but it's all kind of out there in front of you, and you, um, and, and by like trial and error, you basically like teach yourself yep. how to play uh, this game. So, uh, so, so, can you talk about that? Because, because um, it has to be. Um, it has to be on. It has to be on purpose. Um, yeah. Um, it it really just comes down to uh, just 
good game design. Um, uh, it's no one reads tutorials. They'll read 500 pages of lore, but the moment you show a tutorial box, they will their eyes will just glaze over. Um, and it's just it's just the reality. Of this uh, it's just what the reality is. And I, I had situations even in mildly interesting RTS trying to teach people how to play an RTS without having instructions. And I tried instructions before. Um, and uh, I would get I would get one star reviews saying like, I don't understand how to play this. I'm like, there is a tutorial stage right there that you play. But uh, then, you know, eventually you just get rid of the tutorial stage and you just present problems that need to be solved. And through solving those problems, they learn a, they, they learn a new game mechanic. Um, but yeah, it's it just, it's very difficult to do, um, to do well. Uh, there's games that do it really well. There's games that I've played um, that don't do it well. And um, I usually stop playing those games um, or they enamor you with so many tutorials. You're just like, I, I wanna stop, just just stop the tutorials. But, um, but it's, it's hard, it's hard. And you just have to be empathetic of the, the dev and understand that of the game run and understand that they'll figure it out. And if they can't figure it out, it's your fault. The game does fault because you didn't present the, the correct, uh, uh, what's it called, angle for the problem for them to figure it out in that specific way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an art form. It's hard to do. And uh, uh, people get lazy and they think just throwing a tutorial with some instructions is, is sufficient, but it isn't, yeah. <laughs> So, so have you um, have you ever have you ever um, heard of the game Ninth Dawn Three? Uh, I have not. So, uh, so, so, so in 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 some ways, like it's a lot different game than your game, but um, but in some ways, it reminds me a lot of like, like why I like uh, why I like your game is a lot of the reason why I like um, that game, and um, in 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 that game, you kind of have this guy that's helping you. And uh, like it's kind of like a mini tutorial, and then like halfway through, the, um, halfway halfway through the N the NPC that's like the tutorial guy says, "Well, um, you can figure all this out on your own. I'm not very good at explaining stuff." So, um, so that's what the yep. NPC um, that's what the NPC yeah, says. Um, so, yeah. um, so, good luck. Um, so, so so basically um, basically he's saying, "Hey, tutorial over. I'm too lazy to write the rest of the tutorial." Um, but um, but but it's all done like in um, in game that this guy is um, saying it. So so I thought that was really interesting. There's actually a YouTube video. Um, if you type in like Mega Man X or like Mega Man uh, No Tutorial Needed or uh, Mega Man Game Design Tutorial, uh, there's a uh, there's a game dev or a game designer that talks about how uh, the Mega Man levels are positioned in such a way where they teach you the the challenge of an obstacle in a safe way, and then you get like the real the real uh, usage of that obstacle, like platforming and different things like that. Um, but he does a good job of explaining kind of how, how you need to present your problems. You present in a safe environment and then you uh, give them like the real, the, the air quotes, real level. So um, that video is totally worth, uh, worth a watch if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think that's really, really fascinating. Um, so, uh, so, so your, uh, your second, your second game, the, um, the Ensign, um, mm -hmm. I, I read something that you said that said that it was like impossibly difficult or something like that. It's a pre so it's the pre sequel to a dark room, and uh, I love Dark Souls. Um, it's my uh, my favorite game of all time is Nier Automata. Uh, second favorite game is Dark Souls. Um, dark Souls One, not Demon Souls. Dark Souls. Um, so I wanted to capture a lot of the elements of the dusty dusty path and like the roguelike mechanics and exploring and survival, but turn it up, uh, turn the difficulty up really high, but keep it fair. Meaning that if you died, it was definitely your fault. It was not my fault. It was, you know, a misstep on your side or you should have done this or you should have went back and got some more water or you should have like healed before entering that battle. I always made sure that it was fair in that way. And, um, the, the the whole reason I built built uh, the ensign uh, was the lore aspect of it. I want to explore the prequel narrative, but a lot of people uh, were like thrown off by the transitions of the villagers into into um, you know when you find out that you're not a, the good guy potentially, 
And people were like really angry about that. So the ensign, what I did was in the ensign was that I presented situations where your survival depended on you performing an action that you potentially would think as unethical. And the, there are real consequences because you will die and then you would have to start the game over again. Um, so it was an exploration of, of uh, putting, putting that uh, ethos or that merit to test in an environment where it really matters. And uh, so that was the combination that I took in the ends and, the, and how, how that uh, eventually evolved as a game. And I call it impossible because uh, I taunt you and say that it's impossible and to give up. But that in itself keeps you wanting to continue. So there's like this, every time you die, there's this like troll narrator that's like, just give up, man. You're never going to beat this game. Just quit. And then with every, every time that troll narrator comes up, you're, you go, nope, I'm going to beat this game. And then you beat it. And it's just like, it's the most, it's the greatest feeling. It's a wonderful feeling to have. Um, but yeah, I do plan on porting that over. It's just finding the time. Yep. <laughs> Cool and um, and can um, can you talk about um, a noble circle because I because um, I've seen the um, I've seen the trailer um, for it mm -hmm. and it, it looks really interesting um, the sounds uh, the sounds a little bit disturbing um, on um, but um, but but um, but really interesting and um, and and anyway um, yeah. so so, so um, could you talk about that? right so it's uh, actually uh, inspired by. Uh, a book on the Gutenberg project. So this book was written uh, during the Versailles era by a mathematician named Edwin Abbott. And his middle name was Abbott. So his full name was like Edwin Abbott Abbott, uh, which is hilarious. Uh, and he created a, he, he wrote this book about these two dimensional beings and how they interacted inside of this 2D world. And when you're a 2D being, there's no, there's no height. So like, how do you navigate this world? Um, how do you make sure you don't bump into someone? Uh, what, do, what do the houses look like in this world? Um, and the interesting thing that they added, he added to was that the more sides you had, the, um, the, uh, uh, the higher in the caste system you were. So if you were a triangle or three-sided, you were just like a lowly soldier. But if you, had, if you were like an octagon, you were like a clergy or a king of some type. And it was about this whole caste system and the mannerisms of these two-dimensional beings um, that were surprisingly geometrically accurate uh, because of his math uh, mathematical background. And it ended up being, it, it, in reality, it was a satire for uh, the Versailles era and some of the, all the, all the stuff that was going on with regards to the high society and, and uh, before the French Revolution occurred and everything. And so I loved I love the uh, mathematical concepts in there, and I love the satire and the uh, the uh, the um, what's it called? It's not parody. I think it's satire, right? Uh, so the social commentary that was implied but not explicitly stated. So I took that same idea, but I re envisioned uh, that narrative to be uh, set in in the 21st century. So what would that what would the uh, social commentary look like? What would the parody be? What would the satire be? But still have the fun. Uh, uh, mechanics of a game in conjunction with uh, some, some nice uh, musicality and stuff. So all that came together to, uh, to uh, create what, uh, what, what, what ends up being a noble circle. Cool. Yeah. It's, um, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, and, and yeah, with, uh, with all of your games, I, I kept saying, oh, that's, that's not on Android yet. Um, so. Yep. There's a reason for that. <laughs> Stop stealing my games. No. Um, but uh, but the thing was uh, like over that over these past seven years, I've actually uh, built uh, I've actually built my own game engine, uh, so I can do these games faster and deploy to all platforms at the same time when I when I first development and when I first start developing. So um, so that's that's something that's going to really accelerate uh, some of these uh, transitions over to the Android platform and the Switch platform. So um, yeah, it's coming. Cool. And are, are are you talking about your next? Um, are you talking about your next game yet? Uh, so I have actually uh, quite a few prototypes on uh, my itch page. So if you go to amirrazan.itch.io, um, you can see some of the narrative prototypes that I've done. Uh, there's two games that um, I've gotten to. Well, there's three games that I've that are kind of in pre-production. 
Uh, one of them is called um, uh, the Little Probe, and um, it's kind of like a metro Metroidvania, uh, but more uh, specific narrative elements. You're you're on the planet, uh, you're on the moon uh, Europa, which is uh, one of the moons of Jupiter that could potentially have um, uh, life form on there, or like organic life on there. And so you're like this little probe that's traversing the moon, the moon of Jupiter, in uh, like a Metrovania style to figure out if there's life on this planet. So that's one game. Uh, the other game that I'm uh, having pre-production is called uh, Return of Serenity, and um, it's a it's more of like a walking, a low-res walking simulator that uh, explores the story of um, a crew that uh, goes to destroy um, uh, a comet, uh, a meteor that was heading to Earth, and they get lost um, and what the what the fallout is for uh with regards to the events that followed uh the destruction of this android uh, of this uh meteor um so that's another game and then the final one is called sasha and sasha is kind of, is a narrative game again it's a puzzle based narrative game about this entity that is work working through this dungeon but as you work through the dungeon there's questions about who sasha is and what this what is this world that she's uh working in and what the hell is going on so uh those all three of those games uh early prototypes are on my itch page if you want to play those but um yeah three games one of them is will eventually see the light of day and i've got some arcade games like a fun racing games and stuff that i that i'll just probably put out there just for, for shits and giggles cool that's uh that's awesome so so, so one of the um, one of the things that I've noticed, like, uh, like, like when I was when I was growing up, and I and I kind of dabbled in programming, but I I've never actually like been a programmer, um, but um, but but I've always I've always really liked math, and I, I graduated in I graduated in statistics in college, which is basically math, uh -huh. um, and so uh, and 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 when they when they taught programming in the eighties, then it was very very math math based, like like basically if yep. you didn't understand math, then you couldn't be a programmer. Um, but but I've I've met a lot of programmers that are pretty good programmers that just are really really bad at math. And and, yep. and I think um, I think you're um, I'm I'm guessing you're not on on that because otherwise um, otherwise you'd have like weird like math bugs in a dark room and and, and other yes. and other stuff like that. Um, so so I'm kind of wondering if you could talk about like um, absolutely. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, so if you're going to do just like regular, uh, what I call corporate software development and web development, there's very little math in involved unless your vertical actually needs to have math. Um, if you're going to work for a tax and accounting department, guess what? You're going to have to have some math there, but your regular Gmail, Zoom, whatever, there's very little math involved. Um, and, uh, that was generally the case for me, uh, and that was my level of math as far as uh, as far as uh, when I got into game uh, when I uh, started my sabbatical and got into game development. But uh, I did the whole like calculus and thing in, in college and stuff. But you forget all of that shit, um, and that was exactly the case for me. When I got into uh, game development, though, um, I had a I had to ramp up a little bit on my math, specifically trigonometry, uh, trig and trig and geometry. So. Your, your regular algebra arithmetic stuff is still relevant, um, but the moment you start getting into like 2D, uh, 2D collisions and detecting if two things, uh, if you're killed by a bullet or some, a trajectory of like, you know, your character as they jump through the air, you got to know some trig. And uh, so that's the level of math that you have to get into uh, with regards to that. The moment you get into 3D stuff, then you have to learn linear algebra, which is which is a, uh, builds upon your foundational uh, things that you learn, uh, learn in trigonometry. So yeah, if you want to make any kind of 2D platformer game with any semblance of like, you touch this enemy and die, you have to learn some geometry and trig. Huh. That's um... so not too too scary, but <laughs> but yeah. So, so another question I have, uh, we, we kind of talked about this before, um, before the interview, but, um, but you're, um, you, uh, you're, you're not what I would picture a like typical um, de developer and, and a lot of like a lot yeah. of developers uh, that, um, that I know would, uh, would much rather uh, like, like, um, 
like people um people usually don't like public speaking but uh, but it seems like right. uh, but but like like um googling um googling a mirror is on uh, um like like there's tons and tons of videos of you giving um, you you're giving demonstrations you're giving presentations yep. and um and, and you've got a really really nice speaking voice and so um so so i'm wondering like um uh, is there something you you've always been a great public speaker or um or, i learned it <laughs> yeah so, um, i learned it um if I if I could have my way and I had all the money in the world, I would never talk to another soul ever again. And I would just quietly make games in a cave and then release them to a website that just has the links to download and that's it and no communication. And I'd be I'd be very happy. But uh um it's it, it's a there's there's a book out there called Quiet, uh the power of the introvert. And uh, what I uh, what I'd label myself based on that book, there was a term in there called a self uh, self aware introvert. So um, I know I know that I'm introverted, and um, I know the the things that make me uncomfortable or make me anxious or those environments that make me anxious, and I know the protocols to follow for those specific environments. And I just got really good at follow those protocol following those protocols over the over the, um, uh, I think I started my, my first presentation was in 2009. So over that 11 year period, um, I got a lot of practice in, in, in being the extrovert when I need to be the extrovert. And then, um, uh, basically after this, after this, uh, talk, I'll probably like take a nap for 30 minutes. Cause I'll be completely drained and I don't want to talk to anyone for the rest of the day kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely an introvert, uh, uh, as far as like what my comfort comfort zone is. Um, but, but you just, you, you learn, you learned that there's benefits to both. And um, I think that book was really helpful in uh, explaining the benefits. And then um, I, I like to share knowledge, I guess that's, that's another motivating factor is that I care about this stuff and I want people to know people to make the same mistakes I did. And I want people to understand, um, and have empathy for like the other per, other side of the coin and what we go through and vice versa. So uh, I think the combination of those two things um, gets me gets me on the stage, whether I like whether I like it or not. But I, it, it gets easier over time. Huh. So um, so so what was the uh, what, what was kind of the turning point of you? Um, uh, because I've um, I know a lot of people like like ten or twenty years older than you that haven't like realized. Oh well, hey, well I need to. Um, and um, I don't, um, I don't really have enough money to be able to just um, avoid um, programming all the time. Like, um, like, like some people never like break, um, break over to that. And I, and I think probably like 99% of people never, um, um, never like go over to the other side that you're, yep. um, um, that you were able to go over to. So, um, so, so, so what, uh, what happened and why? Well, are you so one thing, I'm definitely not there. Like I have to hustle every freaking day um and um like i yes uh the for the next two to three years i i should be fine but no i mean i want to do this for 40 years like i don't have enough money to survive for 40 years and that's that's the tough part is that uh i'm not over to the i'm not over on the other line i'm doing much better than most people but a lot of it was luck, man. Like a lot of it was timing. A lot of it was luck. Um, I showed up and I, you know, did my part in that equation, but it's just a flip of a coin sometimes. Um, there's a, there's an article I wrote called battle scars. So if you do uh, Amir Rajan battle scars, you can kind of like read uh, everything that I had to do right or get lucky on before I was presented one option, one opportunity to potentially take a few months off to build a video game that just happened to go viral. And there, there's so much at any one of those points in my life, something could have occurred that would have, would have, you know, just immediately eliminated any opportunity to, to, you know, even be at the air quotes level of success that I have now. But uh, yeah, I'm still, I'm still hustling because I know that if I don't, then the money's going to run out. And then two to three years from now, yeah, uh, I would have enjoyed that time off. But then, you know, what am I going to do for the next 37 years? And that's, that's a scary proposition. 
And uh, uh, it's, I'm grateful for as far as I've come, but I also don't want to go back, right? I want to keep doing what I enjoy doing. And it's just, it's, it's always, it always feels like an uphill battle. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it is. Huh. And, and then how, how did you realize that you got lucky? Uh, well, and obviously, um, obviously there's a tremendous amount of skill um, in addition to, um, in addition to luck, but, um, but, but I think, um, I, um, I think you, um, I think you mentioned somewhere that, um, that, that like there, um, that there are plenty of developers that have games as good as yours that just didn't get the, um, yeah. that, that they didn't go viral. Um, and, and, and it's kind of, it's kind of human nature to say, Hey, Hey, well, yeah, yeah, I was successful. That's, um, that's a hundred percent me. Um, so, so, so how did, um, how did you, um, how did you realize that? Or, or, or did you go through a phase where you're like, Oh yeah, I'm awesome. Um, I'm gonna, um, yeah. For me, it was, um, well, one thing, um, uh, just getting to the point where I was able to go to college and just afford it and come out the other end, you know, with, with a skill that society felt was valuable. I, I happened to be lucky enough to enjoy programming. And that, that thing that I enjoyed was actually something that society felt was worth paying for. Um, so that was, so that was the thing. Uh, and um, like, I didn't, I didn't get sick. I didn't break my leg. I didn't get an accident. Um, I didn't have any, any of those life-changing events that could occur over a 27 year period. I was 29 when I took the sabbatical. So think of like all the things that had to go right for 29 years, just to have a period of eight months to take off. And then it was 2013. So 2013 was kind of like the golden age for uh, premium games and indie indie games. This was before Candy Crush came out and some of the monetization strategies that exist existed. So people were open to buying and purchasing premium, you know, premium games. So if I released ADR today, who knows? Who knows if would if it would have even been a blip on on the store? Um, I was lucky to have come across the Hacker News article that showed me the web version of the game. And then I got the email and I was lucky that Michael was, you know, kind enough to see the email, read it and say, yeah, let's go ahead and port it. And then, you know, we'll split the profits. I mean, all those, all those things, like I, if I didn't send the email, it wouldn't have happened. Or if I didn't take the time off in 2013, it wouldn't have happened. Or just anything on, along that trajectory just, makes it terrifying how, how any of this was even possible. Um, so it's kind of how it is. It's just, uh, there's a lot of luck in play. Um, and uh, the, other, the other challenge is that the moment you say that, the, the moment there will always be someone to cut you down. <laughs> so any, any uh, iota of, uh, any attempt or iota of uh, communicating that I potentially had know what I'm talking about, have some skills uh, over uh, someone else, especially in the game dev industry, there's a, there's a high opportunity that they'll, they'll take that uh, as, a, as a means to, to uh, bring me down a notch. So I just, I just don't entertain that anymore. And I just, I just try to continue to do what I do and what I enjoy and just count my blessings from that perspective. Cool. That's uh, that, uh, that's awesome. And, and the speaking of cutting, uh, speaking of cutting you down, uh, one of the things. Uh, w w well, your your apps are rated like very very high. I think like four point eight, four point seven. Yes. Um, like like just very 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 high ratings on pr um, pretty much everywhere. And um, but but something something I've noticed is just kind of human nature is like like even though um, even though you probably even though you only get like one one critical review for every I, I don't know what the math is on that like like every like fifty. Um, positive yep. review that, that then it's just human nature to like read the critical review and be like, and like, yes. um, skim over everything else and be like, oh my gosh. Um, so, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of, like how, um, how you, how you handle that, because that's, um, that's something that, um, uh, that's something that like, like even, um, um, I think, I think like initially it's really, really tough. Um, yes. And it was, uh, when the game went viral, um, uh, the way I handled it was not sleep for 20 days because you just, you get, I was getting 300 reviews a day. Uh, I mean, you, you get 300 reviews a day. You're just like, 
you read every single review and take everything to heart. And um, over time, you just get used to it. You just get used to the the criticism. And then uh, what I what I use as like an objective metric now is that I don't want middle of the road reviews. I don't want three star reviews. I either want you to love it or hate it, because that means that I focused in and targeted the exact audience that the game was intended for. So if the review is five stars, awesome. That's exactly what I want. If the review is one star, awesome. This is exactly, this is not the game for you. Leave your one star review, communicate to the people like, if you don't like games that use ASCII maps, don't play this game, good. That's a good review, thank you. Um, it's the middle of the middle of the road ones that a bunch of like mediocre three star reviews is, are, are uh, means I hit I miss my mark. So um, I think I think that helps deal with the the anger reviews that come at the end. But yeah, some of those reviews are just vicious. Um, interestingly enough, UK. Sorry, there goes my computer again. You would think I'd fix it by now. Sorry, had to log in. Um, Excellent enough, UK hates my game, relatively speaking. So uh, the I, I have a basically nine to one uh, ratio in everywhere else around the world except UK. So nine to uh, nine five star reviews for every one one star review. In the UK, it's three to one, and I don't know why. They just they just hate my game. I I don't know I don't know what it is. Um, other indie games follow the trajectory. Like you look at Monument Valley and how how it got rated. In the U.S. versus U.K., it it's it's uh, within a standard deviation, but for some reason, the U.K. just hates hates ADR. I don't know why. <laughs> it's really um, weird. But uh, but yeah, so that's how I deal with it. You just get used to it, and then you say, if it's a one star review, good. If it's a five star review, good. If it's a three star review, bad. And um, I have very few three star uh, like middle of the road reviews, so that that helps my mental. Uh, yeah, um, and that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting like mental um, uh, mental framework for, for for looking at things. So, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of cool. Um, I um, I kind of want to go back to, uh, to to what you said about like like you like mentor you like mentoring people. And, and I guess this is more a public a public speaking question about like yeah. why uh, or, or how how you got so good at public speaking. Like like what are your uh, what was your technique for getting good at public speaking? Yeah, so I think uh, the the biggest thing for public speaking and what helped me the most is um, know your subject really well. Uh, have deep, deep knowledge um, in the sub subject you're speaking about. And then when you're speaking, just tell your story and your lessons learned. I think those two things put together are, are what really help um, the speaking aspect of it. Um, there's a, there's a lot of speakers out there that will like do presentations of like this is how you do a website in five minutes or you know tutorial and X Y and Z, and um, that's how I initially started too myself, uh, kind of like walking through sample apps or like here's how you build a website step by step. Um, but then afterwards, what you want to do is at any at any skill level, you just want to basically say here's here's the problem, here's my story, and here's what I learned, and I'm sharing this with you in hopes that this will inform your decisions in the future um, if you're if you find yourself in a similar similar location um, so that's that's kind of how uh, that's those are the two things that you need just the deep knowledge and then treating it as more of a uh, as more of a like a retrospective instead of you teaching something or you asserting any kind of you know any kind of thing on, uh, outside of just telling telling your story and what happened to you so you gotta love it. Uh, I think I think it shows if you really give a shit about what you're presenting on versus, you know, it, it's a job or something with slides or whatnot. Cool. And that, um, and and I kind of have a question from the um, like, like like from the aspiring game developer, and and I think that's probably like what what most of your interviews um, have been. Um, so, mm -hmm. so so I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a like or, or I, I tried to think of a um, unique um, question. So um, so. Well, yep. um, so, so when I was uh, when I was a um, when, when I was a kid, I, I really liked making um, games, um, mm -hmm. like, um, like like on Commodore sixty four, and, and a lot of them were just really really basic um, games. And I and I made a um, I made a Q basic game uh, once, but 
like one of the things I realized is that my games I was making were really boring and mm -hmm. um, like, like, like it was fun to make them, but then when I played them, um, they, um, they just, they, they were just really, really boring. And, and, and I yep. think that probably, that probably happens to a lot of people, but, but, but like to me, um, to yep. me that, uh, to me that just really, really discouraged me from game development and, and maybe I would have been a, um, maybe I would have been able to be a great game developer had I been able to get over that, but, um, but just, mm -hmm. um, but just, I, I, I wasn't for some reason. Um, and, and, yeah. and, and, I, and I'm thinking that, um, that, that has to happen to other people because like, you don't, you never program a totally polished game to start out with. Um, yes. so, so how, um, how, 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 how do you kind of get over that, that hump of, oh, I just, I, I just spent like 40 hours making, um, something yeah. that, is completely horrible. Yeah, I think um, a, a part of it's practice. Um, and I, the best way I can explain it, and uh, I think the reason why game uh, developers, and especially in this day and age, have such a hard time uh, getting into getting into space, building something, is that everything is so high fidelity. Like everything's 3D. Um, everything feels impossible to build. Uh, we had the luxury, like back in the day, it was like, Hey, I can build that. It's just text on the screen, and that was awesome. I can build that. It felt it felt uh, attainable. Um, so a, a part of it is that I feel bad for the 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 people, the aspiring indie devs that are trying to do it in the twenty in the year twenty twenty because everywhere you look, it's Fortnite and and uh, you know Red Dead Redemption two and all these like ridiculously high crazy awesome games um, and ADR is kind of that testament of like, look, this is still attainable and you can build something good. Um, so aside of that hump, uh, the, the challenge comes is that you have to, you have to think about like, have you ever played a musical instrument? Um, not, not very well, just like the recorder and um, okay. piano. So, piano. Exactly, so there's, there's two musical instruments that, I, that are generally there, there's the piano and the violin. The beauty of the piano is that you press a key and you get a beautiful sound. And then it allows you, it, the violin is accessible in that it allows you to start playing very quickly and you enjoy it and you have fun. And, and then uh, once you get, it allows you to reach that level of mastery because you get a taste of what it feels like to play a note or like a chord and progression and have a really nice, pretty uh, sound come out or play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Um, Game development is not that. <laughs> game development is like the violin. If you ever pick up a violin and just try to make it sound like anything but a dying cat, it takes time. It it just just to make something that you know doesn't doesn't sound like a dying cat takes hours to get to a point where it does that. And we we push through because we see the you know the the greatest vi the violinist uh, uh the greats uh in violinists we see how beautifully they play and we say like he's just bowing the string it's it's attainable i can do this i can visually see this um but that's what game dev is like it's playing the violin you you're gonna have screaming cats all day long but you get you have to keep your eye on the prize the problem is that in this day and age the prize seems un unattainable and uh, i don't know how to you know help close that outside gap but it's it's doable you can do it um so yeah it sucks but you gotta you gotta kind of get through it and have your small wins uh try to build like a tiny games i actually have a reddit post called uh, seven lessons from seven years of game dev um if you just go through my post history you'll see them and i and i talk about like how do you break down a game how do you think about game development how do you ship something um especially as you if you're starting off, how do you monetize? And some of those lessons that I learned, uh, but, but I think shipping really helps, even if it's a shitty game and you, you thought it was a horrible game. If you, you just put it on the internet and have someone else say, hey, I played your game, it was horrible, but I'm gonna keep track of what you're doing. It's a good feeling. Just getting something out there is a great feeling. 
Well, that's um, uh, that's a uh, that's a really interesting uh, way of looking at it as like violin versus piano and and and, and very very easy to visualize too. So so I think yeah. we're um, I think we're I think we're about out of time. Um, anything um, anything um, anything you want to um, talk about before we wrap up or anything that uh, we missed? I think uh, uh, I think if you want to get into game development again, um, try my game engine out. Uh, I'll, I'll hook you. I'll send you an email with a with a free license. But if you go to uh, dragonruby.org, uh, you'll see you'll see the option for the for the game engine that um, I basically built up and uh, re envisioned from scratch based on the experience that I've had as an indie dev. And um, I'm I'm trying to present game development to be closer to that piano. So it's not going to be 100% of that piano, but I tr I'm trying to bring it close to that piano feeling. Um, so you know, I, I, I try to give it another shot. See if you uh, see if you um, might might find the love and the fun in doing game dev again. And uh, for anyone for anyone that you know listens to this podcast or YouTube video, uh, just email me saying that you know you you heard about it, the engine here, and I'll hook you up with a free license. So they it goes for like uh, 50 bucks for the standard and. Um, the pro edition uh, is going to be two ninety nine a year uh, when when that launches uh, in full force. But I'll hook you up with a standard license for free, um, and you just you just come and build video games with us. So just give it a shot. That's that'd be my that'd be my uh, one thing I'd like to mention, I guess. Cool. That uh, that um, that is awesome, and that's uh, that's really cool um, that you're making a um, a game engine. That's uh, that's awesome. So, um, yep. so, uh, so, so thanks, um, thanks very much for doing this interview. It, it was, um, it was really, really, uh, really, really great to, uh, to get just like um, behind the scenes of one of the coolest yep. games that, uh, that that I've ever played, like um, like, like twice, and um, mm -hmm. and all of the other stuff, and um, and all of your advice for indie developers. Um, it's. And I'll absolutely. send you links to all this stuff so you can have it like in your in your notes and stuff if, if people want to reference those links. I'll make sure to send those oh. over to you. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was. Um, that's what I was going to ask you if um, if you could do that so I can include it in the description. So um, so so thanks um, thanks very much. You're welcome. I mean, thanks for reaching out, man. Uh, I'm always happy to do this stuff. But uh, you're the one that you know put that effort in and said, hey, would you like to interview? So I appreciate it.